Open your Bibles to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. And no, that is not the Palm Sunday passage of Scripture. Palm Sunday is mentioned in all four Gospels. Today is Palm Sunday. And no, I'm not going to say it quickly, but just, and not in passing, but I will acknowledge Palm Sunday. Interesting. Here it is. Palm Sunday is the, is the acknowledgement. It's the Sunday before Easter, almost literally, where Jesus chose to ride into Jerusalem. I, I sometimes imagine it as if, I don't know, there was, all, there was obviously a struggle for a man who did not sin and, 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 and struggled with his humanity. Normally the struggling with my humanity causes me to sin. <laughs> Somehow, somewhere. And he struggled with his humanity and he had made that decision. I think one of the greatest battles that he ever fought as a human in his humanity was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That, and he, he got on the donkey, and, and a donkey, and rode into Jerusalem. And, and the people shouted, as we know, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means to save us. Save us. And their salvation was coming, but not in the manner that they expected or that they wanted. I just saw a pastor that I follow closely from St. Louis, Brian Zahn. I've mentioned him here before, but he posted on his Instagram last night a picture he took in Europe somewhere where, and I saw this in Cuba last week. You see horses, statues of horses. You see these great statues. I've got them down on the Malacan in Havana. You see it in almost every city, but throughout Havana, you see um, Jose Marte from the uh, turn of the century, a leader in Cuba, and you see him on his horse. The horses always have riders <laughs> because they're conquerors. The only time you ever see a riderless horse is when a leader has been stricken and died. I remember John Kennedy and his um, funeral and that riderless horse riding behind the coffin. And Jesus came on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And they took palm leaves, palm branches. And we have palm branches at either door today. Save them for the children. We have enough for the ch If you have two children in your family, take one to start and check later. If there's more, get, get more for your children. But one for, for family, start there with children. And they took the palm branches and they waved them because they were a sign of hope. They were a sign of new life. They were green. <laughs> they had this anticipation like we have. As the snow disappears, the sun shines. It's brighter out. Like, I mean, winter is done. Our captivity is finished for a while. But the people, the Jewish people, they thought their captivity was done forever. And this is the king. This is the king. He's coming, and he's coming into Jerusalem. Hosanna, save us. Save us. You who raised the dead. You who walked on the water. You who healed people. You who worked the miraculous. You who was transfigured. You who just appeared. <laughs> You were everything beyond what we ever imagined. And now, Hosanna, save us. And he rode on a donkey. A donkey that was under the foal of a donkey. One of the gospel accounts said the mother came along with the foal. Maybe try to keep the donkey in line. Is the donkey going to buck off? Jesus, he's never been ridden before. Some say that's why they laid down the palm branches, just in case, just in, I don't know about this, but just in case he, he got bucked off. Give him some cushion when he landed. But they laid him down just to give him, because he was riding on a donkey, for goodness sakes. Let's make this ride a little bit more comfortable. If they only knew about what comfort meant <laughs> and what our comfort was going to cause. And that's the day that we acknowledge today. And I think, no, I know, 
because I can relate to all of us, that I expect God's salvation in ways that I think about up here or I read in books. I listen to messages. God's going to come through. God's my guy. He's going to meet me where I'm at. But he doesn't, he, he doesn't often come in the way I imagine. <laughs> he doesn't often come in the way I expect. The word is clear. The word leads us. But Ephesians says in chapter 3, Now unto him. Say unto him. That's your Hosanna this morning. Say unto him. Who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. According to the power that works in us. In Matthew, Mark I said, right? Mark chapter 5. I want to read a portion of scripture. As we come to the table this morning and prepare our hearts for the next three gatherings. Today, Good Friday, and Sunday. Starting at verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter, she lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her. Another one of the gospel accounts says it was his only daughter. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him. And you see, Jesus responds to faith. There's a lot of people he could have went and saw. Throughout the entire thread of scripture, Jesus is moved by faith. So he went with them, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed. Healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you? And you say, what a bunch of misfits. And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her. Who had done this thing? But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your afflictions. We're just going to focus on this woman. We're not going to read the rest about Jairus' daughter. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to have you turn in a few places here this morning as we head to the table. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is, the devil. Verse 17. Therefore, say therefore, just because, anyway. In all things, he had to make, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to the propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Write these scriptures down. We won't spend a whole lot of time at any of them besides a gospel account. You can put it up on the screen there for me, please, Efren. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I asked you to do that because I forgot where the verse was. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I have a little note that I wrote here. I think it's my, my translation. I don't have a reference to it, but he will give you the strength you require. He will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. I want to read that verse again. No temptation. None. I shared with the Cubans last Sunday morning, this time last Sunday morning, the Lord just impressed upon my heart to talk a bit about Hebrews chapter 2, and I confessed to them that um, I didn't totally understand that verse of Scripture, and I'm still processing. I'm still working on that passage of Hebrews that says that Jesus had to suffer in every way I've ever suffered. And I had, uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned this here at this church, but that um, he's God. Why, why, like, I mean, doesn't he just know? <laughs> doesn't he just know? He knows everything. You know, I, I'm analytical, sometimes too analytical. And I'm just trying to work this out and... In every way I've been tempted, he's been tempted. And then I think of certain areas where I've been tempted, I'm thinking, really? <laughs> really? But there's just some things, as it says in Isaiah chapter 40, his understanding is unsearchable. But he's given us something to understand. But then as I search the scriptures, and I read a verse like that, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. And I heard a message once where a gentleman or somebody had said that, that, that God, God knows how much you can take. <laughs> he, knows, he knows your breaking point. And then I, so I envisioned, what? You mean God lets me go to my breaking point? What, does he play games with me? Does he let me walk closer and closer and closer? He says, no, 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 don't worry, I won't let you fall. Closer and closer and closer. And then, you know, does, does he tempt me? He tests us. He certainly tests us. And as we've said here before, that when God's testing our hearts, when God's testing us, when you're tested, what happens after the test? You go on to other things. <laughs> Normally, you go on to greater things. Another step. So God certainly tests us. But does he tempt us? No, of course he doesn't tempt us. Scripture says clearly he doesn't tempt us. So what this scripture actually means is that God empowers you for everything. You can sustain a gentleman lying on his knees, one of 21, who's going to have his head cut off because he's a Christian, because he's a person of the cross. He can endure this. Some of us have looked at that and we thought, how? How? Because of the power of God within him. That's how. Some of you have gone through things. Victor has gone through some things in the 90s where I used to look at him and watch him and just try to support him. And, and I remember once I was in the hospital with him at the Hotel Dew and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> I don't. He did it. He did it. Because of the power of God within him. So he knows. He does know. And by God's grand design, God's grand purpose, somehow we are all identified with that, with this. And it enables us, yes, to be more than conquerors. It enables us to stay and to stand and to see the goodness of God in our midst. But oh, what a price. The song that Jeff led us in, that he sees us, he's intimately acquainted with us. He, yes, yes, 
Yes, your problems matter. Who's ever thought that, oh, in comparison to somebody else, my problems? Like, I mean, I, I'm ashamed to tell you I have a problem. It's so large in my own life, but like, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I can mention it. God knows how big your problem is to you. He knows how big my problem is to me. And he is the way maker. And the way went through Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But you know, I can identify, Kim, in areas where I thought that God could come into my life and rescue me and things throughout my life. It, I look back now, and I'm old enough. I've been saying this a lot lately. I'm old enough now to be able to look back and tell you, it didn't happen, Herb, the way I thought it was going to happen. But by golly, it happened. My goodness, it's still happening. I'm still alive. Does this make sense this morning? I certainly hope it does, because it's just, it's been... Herb, and Herb said to me a couple times on an airplane or in a van or something, you're working on Sunday's message? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm working on. <laughs> and Eduardo says, I gotta get, you got your message ready? I said, I think I do. I wasn't going to have communion this morning. Because we were coming on Friday. Jordan just gives me the look. I like that look. So if it's a little frozen in the center, it's my fault because I didn't take it out of the freezer until I got here this morning. <laughs> because I want to get to Good Friday. I really want to get to Good Friday. The woman reached out and touched his garment. A lot of people were touching him. There was more than one person that needed healing. She had suffered for 12 years with an issue of blood. She spent all that she had. The gospel account here says she said, if only she said, say she said, she said. Another gospel account says she said to herself in her heart. So she was thinking about it. She was saying it and she reached out and something happened. And she felt shame. She wasn't even supposed to be close to people. And Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. He waits. Can you imagine God waiting on me? That he waits? That's where the word mercy and loving kindness come into account. He waits for me to touch him, to reach out every day. There was a transference of power. Jesus felt the power leave him because she reached out and she touched him and he has enough power for each and every one of us in this place today there is no there is nothing that's going on in your life right now spirit soul or body physically mechanically <laughs> relational Nothing that's happened yesterday, today, the fear of tomorrow. Nothing that he does not have the power to meet you with. Good. And it came at a price. I wish, I wish I could do what Jesus does and speed forward here, but I wish I could go to Good Friday now. Because I have an illustration. I just have something in my heart. I just have a couple things to say on Good Friday that has really brought home what this table is to me. So he's given to you the power. Here comes a question I don't think I've asked very often here, but I'll ask it. I'll even do it out loud. Who, experienced, who experiences temptation? Some people don't like to uh, admit that. But who experiences temptation? Some people succumb to temptation today. They didn't come to church. <laughs> they made another choice. <laughs> We think of temptation, all we think, we think of temptation, we think of something dark, something sexual, something hidden. He knows every temptation you have, are, or will ever experience. And he's given us the power. First of all, he's paid for it. Second, he has given us the power to conquer it. Who, who's glad that you suffer temptations today? Yes, I said that. That you didn't suffer maybe 10, 15, 20 years? Who's glad that God just didn't give, just make you accountable for everything on day one? 
Amen? Because he's personal. He, he sits at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession. Peter, I can't grasp that either. How does he do that? I don't know. The scripture says he does. What I can grasp is that I need power. What I can grasp is the power came through this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I believe it says, the Apostle Paul says that I may know him. If you could put that up for me, I'd really appreciate it because I'm, I'm interested here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Can you keep, show me old King James? Why, wow, you're quick. What about NIV? Okay. Back to New King James. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I cannot control resurrection power. Resurrection power is God's. It's his. He did it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. I receive it by faith. I believe it. That's why baptism. Baptism by immersion, in my opinion, is one of the most important decisions a believer will ever make. I look so forward to the day that my grandchildren get baptized. Because that is a public declaration. That is an act of your own will to say that I am dead. I am alive in Christ. I believe, and I've seen this in my own boys. I've seen this in Aaron. I remember his baptism vividly. I remember Alexander vividly. I was in the water with Aaron. I didn't baptize him. I baptized Alexander. And I can see, I can see, and I thought of this just recently. I can see, I can go back and I can play. I think you were both about 16 years old, thereabouts. I can see where changes took place in your life, in your spiritual development after your baptism. I never made the connection until I just thought of that during 1,700 kilometers in the island of Cuba. that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I have no control over the power of his resurrection. I do have control over my sufferings. I do have control over my death. The decision to die is mine. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that the fellowship of his sufferings, that I'm sick, I'm poor, I'm, I, I'm not getting along with anybody, this or that. No, that's not it at all. It means identifying with Christ. It means breaking through. It's meaning experiencing new life. And for new life to be had, something has to die. And the Apostle Paul himself said, I die once a week. Every day. Every day. I die. I choose to suffer. Can you imagine calling that message, putting that in the paper, choosing to suffer? Where is everybody today? Nobody's here today. Choosing to suffer. Choosing to die because I need resurrection power. But making the decision, I want resurrection power. First Peter. As we prepare to come to the table. (laughs) Efren, I gave you my notes. First Peter what? Put it up there for me quickly. Quickly and take it off. Real quick, Efren. Quick. First Peter what? Second Peter. That's why. Second Peter. Second Peter 1. Good. Take it down. Oh, I have it here. I have a postcard my dad gave me when he was in uh, West Virginia in 1969 that I found, and I keep it as a bookmark. Hi. I'm taking for granted you're being very good. No, 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 no. He said, I'm taking for granted you're being very, very good at all times. We'll see you soon, Dad. Master Ricky Mills. The reason he said, I'm taking for granted you're being very, very good, because he'd probably called that day or the day before talking to my mom, and he heard me come in from the back door as my dad's on the phone. I'm saying, he's dead. He's dead. I killed him. I killed him. My mom says, hold on. My dad said, who's dead? Who's dead? Who did he kill? Who did he kill? I killed my rabbit by accident. (laughs) I did. I fell on him. Chasing him in the backyard, the grass, the grass was all, that's the truth, right, mom? The grass was all wet, and we all got rabbits. My rabbit took off on me, I went running on him, I, I was running faster than he was, I went like this, and kaboom, I fell right on top of him and killed him. My dad went and bought me a postcard. 
<laughs> Where am I, Efren? We don't know. Second, oh, he can, oh, Efren can put it up there, and you guys can't see it. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter. Boy, Simon Peter knew what it was all about to see Jesus suffering. Wow, he was there. He was there. Next to the Apostle Paul, the Simon Peter's my man. I can identify more. Paul says to imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Thank God he didn't say imitate Peter. <sighs> imitate me as I also imitate Christ. But I'll tell you, I can identify more with Peter than I can with Paul. Can I get a witness? Yeah, yeah, I can. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied. That's the apostle Peter. He knew he needed it. Multiplied. Give it to me, Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready for this? Verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things, Things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. Verse 3 again, as his divine power. He walked into Jerusalem. He got on a donkey. He rode a donkey. They shouted, Hosanna, save us. And they were just going to see him conquer the Romans. He was going to conquer Jerusalem. He was going to bring salvation to the people everlasting life. New life. They didn't expect him to go on a hill in Calvary. They didn't expect him to be crucified like a common criminal and to be dead and buried and put into a grave and go to hell for three days and secure our salvation, secure our power, secure our lives so that we could know, so Drew could know, Tanya could know, Pat, Kenny, so that we could know divine power that pertains to life and godliness. So there is nothing, I speak to each and every one of us here today, there is nothing in your life that your divine power cannot touch and is not interested in and is not ready to perform with resurrection power in our lives. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think according to the power that works in us. As we work our way through this Passover week, they call it the Passion Week. I think I might even watch myself some Mel Gibson this week. I've only watched that movie once. I think I'll watch it again. As we move through the Passion Week, and we come up to Good Friday and meet here on Good Friday and work our way to Resurrection Sunday, rejoicing. We have rejoiced today. I don't want to make this a solemn moment. Someone said to me, Rick, you focus once. They said, you focus too much on the cross. On Good Friday and Easter, you spend too much time in Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Guess what? Get ready. Good Friday, we're going to be in Isaiah 53. Because I know to get the resurrection power, to know resurrection power, I've got to know how to suffer with Christ. I've got to know and make that call that however he's leading me, whatever God is saying to me, whatever he's speaking to me, and how much my flesh or my own ideas or my own, my own desires or my fears are contrary to what his word says or what, the he, what he says, I make a choice. I make a choice every day in my thoughts, my words, my actions. And I'm telling you folks, a lot of times that hurts. That goes contrary to my nature, my old nature. And I'm reminded I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. New every day. He made a way so that those palm branches would be constant in our lives. We would know life. We would know it abundantly. Oh, we want it. We want it. We want to prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. We want to know the provision of God. We want to know the will of God. We want to know the peace of God. We want to get along with everybody. We want to have a smile on our face all the time. And I tell you that we have an enemy that is as real today as he was yesterday. And he will be until that day. And he has given us the promise that one day, I've paid the price. I've given you the power. And one day, the power of sin will be no more. And until then, you live on this terrestrial ball. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds like suffering to me. What did Greg and Rebecca Sparks used to talk about? Suffering here below and talk about loving Jesus. 
And when we come to this table, we remind ourselves of his, aren't you glad it's not our blood? Our broken body. We want healing. And we'll talk about that a little bit on Good Friday. We want healing of our body. And I believe he heals our bodies. Dallas Holm sang a song. Dallas Holm traveled with David Wilkerson. That's where Dallas Holm got his start. He used to be the music leader for the Teen Challenge Crusades, for David Wilkerson's Crusades. So I understand this song. I only see a couple of you going like this, and the rest of you don't know who Dallas Holm is. But Dallas Holm sang this song, Jesus, and he used to sing it to people who were suffering addiction. And I think, I imagine he wrote it for people that he was talking to, playing for, who were in a 12-month program at Teen Challenge. He says, Jesus will heal your home, my friend. He will. Jesus will heal your home, my friend. But first, he must heal your heart. Jesus will heal. He'll be our healer. He'll be constant. He will watch over us as we go through life as he tarries and our earthly bodies just slow down a bit. And we can believe, as Psalm 92 says, that we'll be fruitful in old age. I'm talking to some of us other people now. I'm including myself in that category now. That we'll be fruitful in old age. But just don't leave it to the older people. Leave it as your children get older, as you get older, as your children get to school, and they get out in this world around us. Jesus will heal your home. He'll be the healing of your home, my friends. He'll be the healer of your life. But first, he must heal your heart. And as we work our way to Good Friday, and as you come to the table this morning, I pray that we see ourselves coming, recognizing that, whoa, he came into Jerusalem. He came humbly on a donkey, and he shook up the world. And he didn't come as they expected, but he went to the cross, and he suffered brutality. He died, he rose again, that I would know life. I would know resurrection power in my life. And that we would let him go to that place where we need it most. We would avail ourselves. We'd like to go right to the top. He says, no, there's a climb. There's a climb to be had and you'll be made. My Can you imagine being a mountain climber, a climber and being helicoptered up? And there you go, you climb the mountain. And then some people climbed, some people went the proper way. Then you all cut you. The, what about uh, they used to have these marathon? They still have the marathon races. I remember in the '80s there was some guy who just showed up and he won the race, the New York Marathon. He won the race. Nobody had ever heard of him. Well, he started three miles before the finish line. He failed. He failed. And God doesn't want us to fail. Yes, God tests our hearts. He does, because there are crowns. <laughs> There's rewards in heaven. There's rewards here. But to gain the reward, we've got to climb. Because he's the king of our hearts. He knows better than you. He knows better than me. He knows the work that needs to be done. And oh, what a price he paid, Dylan Steele. What a price he paid. So I want to I close, come to the close of our service on this Sunday and ask you to come to the table on this Palm Sunday. And, and I think we've done this before, but I, I want our benediction. I want our word of confession, our declaration. Hopefully I've painted the picture clear enough for me. <laughs> he came for the Jewish people. He came to save. He came for me. And as you reflect on this Good Friday, as we work our ways through this Passion Week and up to Friday, that God really meets you where you're at. He's interested. He really is. He wants divine power in your life where you need it. And we know where we need it. But he knows better than we do. And we would participate in the climb with joy. So come to the table. Come to the table. Take of his broken body. Take of his shed blood. And say, for me. He came for me. Come to the table this morning. He took his bread. He took the bread, his body. Give me thanks. He broke it. This is, they still didn't get it. They still didn't know. This is my body broken for you. What's broken in your life? It's just some things where I'm broken. 
I don't mean broken as if I've come to the end, I'm hitting rock bottom. Maybe that's some of us. But what's broken in our life? What just doesn't seem to work right? And you are so aware of it. And you know. You know, none of us are perfect. There's some things we just won't be able to do. <laughs> we weren't meant to do them. But there are some things I'm meant to do. And I know in my life, there's just some things that just seem broken in my life. And I just, I've tried so hard to fix it. <laughs> I've tried to fix it and I can't. That woman could not heal herself. She spent all the money she could. She went to every available resource. And then she heard about Jesus and she reached out. By faith, she said it. And she touched him. We sing the song, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. No, I touched him. <laughs> oh, I touched him. So see that broken place. As you come to the table this morning, and I think most of us could probably identify with this, and if you can't, ask God to reveal areas in your life where he wants to come and show you resurrection power. More. Didn't we not just sing that? More? <laughs> More. This 2015 Easter season. Just imagine, it could be our last. For me. Say that more for me. Come to the table.